Hello, and welcome to the crisis intervention section of our From Hurt to Hope Advocacy Guide webinar series. This segment is being presented by Penny Maples. Penny is currently the Director of Education at the Sexual Assault Center of Pierce County, and she is also the former Child Advocacy Specialist here at WICSAP. Penny is also one of the authors of the From Hurt to Hope Guide. And here is Penny. Thank you, Tricia. Today we're going to be talking about crisis intervention, and this is going to be based on the Hurt to Hope, a Child Sexual Abuse and Assault Advocacy Guide. The training itself is not about the guide. Um, it's more information to help you work with child sexual assault and abuse. The CSA guide is set up in a, a learner and user-friendly format and should be used as a resource and reference. The goal of crisis intervention is to alleviate acute distress of sexual abuse and assault, to begin stabilization, and to assist in determining the next steps. These can often be the most challenging calls. Sometimes these calls may present as information and referral. Occasionally a client will minimize what they're experiencing, and so they'll call simply asking for a certain referral, and you really, really need to listen and find out what it is they're really looking for. Other times they will be in full crisis mode. The one thing you need to know when doing crisis intervention, especially related to child sexual assault and abuse, are, your pro are the program's best practice. It's vitally important that advocates know and understand the effect of child victimizations, especially when dealing with crisis calls. The Hurt to Hope Guide has a CSA overview that will give you some really good background, and I'll talk about different resources during the presentation. These resources will be listed on a slide at the end of the training. Other good resources are Darkness to Light, Dr. Tony Cavanaugh Johnson's books. Um, agencies have actually been sent these books over the years. One is the Understanding Children's Sexual Behaviors, What's Natural and Healthy, and the other one, Helping Children with Sexual Problems, a guidebook for parents and substitute caregivers. Uh, they could also be ordered, and that information will be at the, on the last slide. Uh, the, the Hurt to Hope guide itself has information on child sexual victimization. WICSAP offers trainings related to CSA, and also you have access to the Child Advocacy Specialist there who's got some great information. One of my favorite resources is Miss America by Day by Marilyn Vanderbur. Besides her story, she's done a lot of research, and she has some really, really good information there about child sexual assault, victimization, what that looks like, um, what the effects can be. And again, we'll talk more about that towards the end of the training. Caregivers need to be reassured that children who are believed and supported often do well in their recovery from abuse. You often will get, or excuse me, seldom will get calls from a child. Usually it's going to be a parent, caregiver, or teen. And the parent or caregiver needs to know that they're a vital part of this recovery. Most agencies have one advocate who's a part of the county child pro protocols, but all advocates need to be knowledgeable in regarding the protocols. Knowing which agencies are involved, what their role is, will make you better prepared to give the client the correct information and the best support when dealing with other members of the multidisciplinary team. As with information referral calls and general advocacy, you must have access to current resources. Now this may include knowing the resources in nearby communities as well as those in your areas. Smaller communities may not have the resources needed by a certain client or the family may not want to work with someone in their community because they don't want people to know what's happened. And you can talk about confidentiality, but oftentimes if they go to another resource, there's somebody there that they know or somebody who knows them, and it can be uncomfortable for them. Caregivers are going to have a wide range of reactions to their child's sexual assault. They may feel guilty because they didn't keep their child safe, as it were. As with all victims of sexual assault, they need to be reassured that unless they knowingly put their child in the care 
of a known sex offender, they are not at fault. They may be very angry and not know where to put that anger. So initially, you may feel the brunt of it. That anger can be at themselves. It can be at the offender. It can be even at the child, especially if the child hasn't disclosed until years down the road. Staying calm and validating their feelings will often help stabilize them and get them focused. You may have to get another advocate or a supervisor to take over if the anger is really frustrating for you. And sometimes just hearing another voice is enough to help dissipate the situation. Depending on what they perceive as the crisis, you may say, you're right. Often the legal system can be very frustrating with all the postponements or the interviews, et cetera. Let's figure out what options you have relating to then whatever it is they're concerned about. They may appear detached or uncaring, and you need to realize that this may be their coping mechanism. One of the most frustrating calls you may get is when a parent seems to be supporting or more worried about the offender, or when the offender is a sibling and the parent has no clue how to deal with this. They love both their children and they don't know what they're supposed to do. Their gut reaction may be to send the victim out of the home, not realizing that this is further victimization to that child. Siblings are actually the number one offenders and your agency needs to have current information on what's available in your community for these families. Signs and symptoms of child sexual assault and abuse can be found at the resources I talked about earlier, Darkness to Light, Tony Cavanaugh Johnson, Miss America by Day, and WICSAP. But it's important to note that about half of child victims show no outward signs. There may only be the child's disclosure. This does not mean that the child has not been or will not be affected by abuse. It simply means that there are no discernible signs at this time. Also, children seldom disclose immediately after the abuse. It may be weeks, months, or even years before the child or teen tells anyone what's happened. Caregivers may be triggered by their own past abuse and may have a couple of different reactions. They may feel that they had this happen to them and they believed that they were not impacted by the abuse, so their child should be the same way. They may often even say to you, they just need to get over it, I did. Again, this is another reason for advocates to understand the effects of childhood sexual assault and abuse. They may have a rush of emotions they feel they cannot cope with, and it may feel that they're back in the middle of their own abuse. Although you may feel this is not about them, it's about the child, you have to remember that the parent or caregiver who supported will be better able to support the child. Knowing client best practices, OPA standards state that an immediate available 24-hour personal response will be provided in a variety of settings to an individual presenting a crisis related to sexual assault or abuse. Your agency should have a protocol to meet this standard. To a client with a perceived crisis, seconds can seem like hours. So the first thing you need to do is be sure the client is safe. This may be the first step of determining, is this a crisis call or a true emergency? Is the caller or child suicidal? Know your agency's protocol for that. Do they need to get to a safer place or are they at risk for another assault? Do they need immediate medical attention? Should 911 be called? An advocate must take the appropriate actions. Everyone, even advocates, has their own personal reaction to a crisis or emergency. It does not matter how well trained you are. You must be aware how you react. Take a deep breath and stay calm. This is the client's crisis, not yours. Knowing your agency's protocols, your county child abuse protocols, and your available resources will help you stay out of crisis mode. When you're dealing with adults, unless you have a vulnerable adult uh, by age or disability, it's usually easy to assure them that the call or information given during a walk-in is confidential. When dealing with youth under 18, the concept of keeping the balance of confidentiality and mandated reporting could be dawning. And again, we'll talk more about that later in this training. 
As mentioned before, it's vital that the advocate stay calm and non-judgmental. This is the client's crisis. Simply listening can often reduce the client's crisis reactions and help stabilize the situation. We all have strong feelings about kids and need to know what our hot buttons are. You know that adult victims can often sense any approval or disapproval from an advocate. Children and teens can be just as sensitive, if not more so. They will often give out little bits of information to test your reactions. Teens may have been in a situation of risky behavior, what's perceived as risky behavior, when they were assaulted and may already have been punished by their parents for where they were or what they were doing. They lost all power by the sexual assault and felt that even more by parents and how they perceive you, law enforcement, or the PA's office will respond. Again, listening and validating the caller's feelings can be the best tools for diffusing the crisis. You could say, you must feel really frustrated about having to find child care for all the appointments you ha are asked to keep. Or it must be hard for you to feel like you have so many people telling you what you have to do. If possible, reassure them that this is normal procedure and you understand how frustrating it can be. What is the one thing they're having the hardest time with? This may not be what they originally saw as the crisis. Addressing this primary concern and do not overload them with information. If the answer to their crisis is a referral, be prepared to give them a specific person's name and direct number or extension. Let them know what they can expect when they contact this resource. Are there no other child, children allowed? Is there a waiting list? Uh, will there be more paperwork? Give them as much power and control as possible, even if they're a teen or a tween. You can make the decision if you want to do A or B. If they are 13 or over, they may be able to decide if they want to make an appointment with a therapist. They can decide if they want to have a medical exam done or if they want to stop it at any point. Whether adult, teen, or child, let them know that you appreciate how hard it was to make this call, how courageous brave, supportive they've been. Let them know that they can call back at any time. Ask if you or another advocate can call them back tomorrow and just check in. And make sure that they're in a safe place to do that or that it's okay. Um, if it's a teen, they may even want you to text them. As oftentimes, they will actually communicate better that way. That's all they've known, so that's often how they respond. Truly be present for the caller or walk-in client. That can establish a trusting relationship, help them out of crisis mode, and help them prioritize their needs. Okay, let's talk about mandated reporting. When do I drop the mandated reporting bomb? Sometimes that may depend on any specific protocol your agency has. Ideally, establishing trust and rapport with the client will make this easier for all. If you do have a patient, excuse me, if you do have a parent or caretaker calling, go through all the steps of listening, validating, and possibly addressing the primary concern first. Find out if the abuse has been reported. If it has not, explain that since the victim is under the age of 18, a mandated report will have to be made. The parent may have fears that CPS will take the child away. Reassure them that if the child is in an environment that is safe, that there's no offender in the home, that the best practice for child is usually with a non-offending parent or caregiver. Let them know that you will have to report the abuse and that it would be a good idea for them to do the same. This may assure the authorities that the caretaker has the child's best interest at heart. Give them information they need to report. It often helps to let them know you have to report this at your first opportunity, but within 48 hours. Find out exactly when they can call. Let them know that you will give them time to call first. This information can result in another crisis situation for the parent. So listen to them and address their fears to the best of your ability. Never make any promises 
with them. Know that this will let them know that this will probably be the hardest call that they've ever made. Make sure they actually listen to what you are telling them. Let them know that they can call you back at any time and remind them how courageous they have been and how supportive they've been of their child. Now, establishing rapport and trust with anyone you know or suspect is under the age of 18 is paramount. Often, newer advocates tend to mention mandated reporting before they've established a connection and trust with the teen. These calls usually end with a caller hanging up before they get what they need from the advocate. The likelihood of them calling back is slim to none. If the trusting relationship is established before you have any identifying information, you could let the caller know that she could remain anonymous to you and receive advocacy services. Now, by doing this, you offer your advocacy line as a safe place to turn for help and support. This will continue to build trust that hopefully will lead to full disclosure to you or your agency. When you think you are at that point, you could say something like, I know that reporting the assault or abuse is very scary, and it may be the hardest thing you've ever had to do. I care enough about your safety and well-being that I want to do what I can for you to make the pain stop and that you no longer have to carry the pain and burden of this assault or abuse. Be sure that you fully explain what may happen through this process and that she can have an advocate with her for any medical and or legal processes. Be very clear that you are not abandoning her after the report is made. You can help her make plans to report and then let her know where your report will fit in. Again, remind them how brave they were to make the call in the first place. There is information in the guide to help you understand mandated reporting under appendices on page 125. Having knowledge or and a good rela working relationship with your county multidisciplinary team can help you appreciate the work they do and it actually can help you better explain possible outcomes to the victims. It also helps in establishing and or maintaining trusting relationship with the victim or the family. All the different members of the MDTs, the multidisciplinary teams, have their own agendas by nature of who they are and what they do. Uh, prosecuting attorney's office has a certain mandate or goal that they have to have in the, in the um, evidence that they have. What do they require? Law enforcement has certain goals or mandates that they have to have. They need to do this, this, and this, and then they're done, okay? Child advocacy centers have certain things that they do that they need to accomplish, and then they're done. So the only constant with these clients, with these victims, with these teens or children and caretakers is probably going to be the advocate from your agency. And so the more involved that you can be with the other multiple disciplinary team members, the more you're going to be able to support that child, that victim, that caretaker. Okay, remember this is not your crisis. You must stay calm and non-judgmental. You need to listen carefully and be sure this is not an emergency. If it is, take the proper actions. Validate the client's feelings and concerns to help stabilize the situation. Find out their main concern and address that. They're not in a mindset to deal with a lot of information. So be very specific about what you're giving them, what their role is, what they can do to be a part of this, what they can do to problem solve, what they can do to have power and control. Those are all vitally important. Be sure they can follow through with their main priority. And do not drop the mandated reporting bombshell until report and trust have been established. Again, they may just hang up on you. Even caretakers, they may have too many fears or too many stories out there about CPS and they're going to come take your kids away. Um, 
And with you, that could be that could be a valid concern, depending on who the perpetrator is. They may be taken out of the home. So be sure that you let them know, related to their situation, what all options may exist um, during the mandated processing uh, process. Knowing and understanding your agency protocols, your child county abuse protocols, and your resources will give you a strong foundation to handle any of your child sexual assault and abuse calls. Okay, the resources that I talked about, Darkness to Light, you can find them at www.darkness the number two light.org. And they have handouts, they have booklets, they have all sorts of information that would be helpful to you. Dr. Tony Cavanaugh Johnson, she can be reached at Tony, T O N I, at T C A V J O H N dot com, or her website, www dot tcavjohn.com, and she has other booklets, she has games, she has other information on her website that could be helpful to you. Miss America by Day by uh, Marilyn Vanderber. This is a great book to help you understand child sexual assault and abuse. Marilyn also gives some really good information on how to talk with kids, why they don't tell, and sibling abuse, which I said earlier, uh, siblings are the number one offenders on child sexual assault and abuse. So you can order it off her website, the www.missamericabyday.com. And on her website, I think she also has sexual assault information listed separately or you can order it from the WICSAP library. So understanding crisis intervention calls for some people can be really scary and intimidating. But if you know resources, if you know your protocols, if you have information on child sexual assault and abuse, um, you can be the biggest support and make the biggest change in what's going on with the caretaker or the parent or the child. <clears throat> 